we have some really exciting photos and really exciting news coming from Uranus. I mean, Uranus. And today we're going to be discussing everything that was recently discovered, including some of the best pictures we have so far coming out of James Webb Space Telescope. And actually one of the reasons this is kind of exciting is because this is one of those planets that rarely gets mentioned at all. And so of all planets out there, we actually know about Uranus the least. And so in this video, let's discuss some of these new discoveries, talk about these new pictures, and also talk about what all of this means. And let's start with the most recent news, or basically the most recent picture taken by the James Webb. The picture that really highlights gorgeous rings around Uranus, presenting us with the most complete view of the entire object, including its very powerful storms that you can see in one of the polar regions. And unlike other pictures from other planets that you can probably find in some of the videos in the description, because Uranus is essentially sort of orbiting on its side, approximately 98 degrees compared to the rest of the planets, this is literally what it looks like from planet Earth. We're facing its north side, and we see all of its rings directly face on. Although for scientists, the most exciting part in this picture are all of the seasonal activities in the northern polar cap. Here you can actually see a bright white inner cap along with the dark lane in the bottom of the cap itself, which at the moment have no explanation, but basically suggest extreme activity on the surface. We also finally get to see the elusive Zeta ring, an extremely faint ring that's the closest to the planet. In comparison, this was actually the first image taken approximately 8 months ago, and this was in different frequencies and did not show us as much detail. Two of the rings here are missing. We also get to see 9 of the 27 moons around the planet, with all of them visible in this image right here. We actually even get to see some of the moons inside the rings that were previously invisible to other telescopes. But obviously the brightest moons are also the largest in the system. Ariel, Miranda, Oberon, Titania and Umbriel. But like I mentioned, it's really the vortex in the North Pole that's the most exciting discovery for the scientists studying this planet. But the reason this spot appears so white is actually because this is a much warmer region compared to the rest of Uranus. We've actually discussed this in one of the previous videos, where this was observed using different frequencies by using ALMA telescope, and you can learn more about this in one of the videos in the description. And so basically, along with the previous image, we now have some of the best images of this planet ever produced by any telescope showing us Uranus in a way we've never seen it before. Here is actually a previous image by the Hubble telescope, and this looks nothing alike. I mean, obviously the polar cap is still there, and the unusual cyclone extremely close to it, but everything else is definitely different. And so this new image basically shows us all of the 13 rings with the two previously hidden rings in all of their glory. But what the scientists really want to study now are of course the polar caps, and mostly because this is atmospheric storms that seem to be seasonal, a single season here lasts for approximately 21 years, mostly because it takes 84 years to orbit the sun. And so every once in a while, basically every season, this planet completely transforms. It looks entirely different depending on when you look at it. But even more intriguingly, this doesn't just happen to the planet, it also happens to its moons. And so one of the recent studies discovered something really intriguing about the moons and about something that they undergo every season. A lot of these large moons seem to undergo an unusual change we've never seen before anywhere. They basically acquire a temporary atmosphere, or technically exosphere, twice per every orbit, or basically during two seasons. Now this is mostly based on computer simulations and modeling, but here the researchers from the recent study assessed some of the ices on the surface of these moons, revealing that the seasonal changes here are so intense that the radiation from the sun is strong enough to force a lot of the size to sublimate, transforming into gas and forming exospheres on the surface. Now quite a lot of different objects out there have exospheres, which are basically extremely thin atmospheres, and here's one example from the moon. They actually form for very different reasons depending on the object, and in case of the moon it seems to be more or less electrostatic in nature and formed by the interaction with very powerful charged particles coming from the sun. But other objects, usually icy objects, form exospheres when the ice sublimates and forms a relatively thin layer around the planet. On many of these moons, it seems to happen when it's basically just slightly warmer than usual, and very likely stays this way for many many years. But once it gets colder, or basically once the winter comes, a lot of this ice then falls back on the ground and freezes once again for many many years until the next season. Although in terms of the actual atmospheric pressure, it's extremely low. It's not even one millionth of the atmospheric pressure on Earth, so basically it's barely visible or barely noticeable. Nevertheless, this seems to be a recurring cycle and it seems to repeat every few seasons. Basically recirculating some of these ices 
and very likely changing the surface just a little bit over time. Intriguingly, the scientists who propose this also suggest that just by landing on some of these moons and basically walking around, the temperature from the bodysuit itself would produce enough heat to suddenly sublimate a lot of the size around you, in essence sort of forming an exosphere everywhere you go. And so that's how extremely sensitive some of these ices are, and that's of course how extremely cold it is in a lot of these regions. Then, in a separate study, we also discovered more information about the rings, and specifically that the rings technically should have been bigger, potentially even similar to Saturn. And the reason the rings are small, or the reason the rings are the way they are, is actually once again because of these five major moons. Their orbit around the planet seems to produce significant emission of dust from the Uranian system, essentially controlling the size of the rings and reducing them in size dramatically. And so by conducting a dynamical simulation using the Uranian system, here the scientists discovered certain regions around the planet with quite a large amount of mass loss that seems to occur in just a few million years. As a matter of fact, 35% of the entire mass of the rings would be lost in just 500,000 years. And all of this just the result of the interaction of the moons as they orbit around Uranus. Now something similar happens around other planets as well, and intriguingly, this also explains why Jupiter seems to have extremely small rings as well. And more importantly, this also suggests the origin of the rings. They're not the result of some kind of an ancient impact or some kind of an ancient event that produced these rings lasting for billions of years. These rings seem to be relatively recent. They must have formed within the last few hundreds of millions of years, a result of a much larger moon or a larger object that came too close to Uranus. And so here, it's probably the result of some kind of a fragmentation of either an ancient moon or potentially an ancient asteroid that came too close to the planet and with time fell apart. This is how we believe all rings must have formed around these planets and is basically the result of what's known as the tidal disruption. The event that slowly stretches the object, forming the rings and making it orbit for millions and millions of years, but not billions of years, as we've learned from the study and similar studies before. Or I guess in more scientific terms, all of this is a result of a very specific resonance formed by the large moons in the Uranus system, although it looks like the largest moons, Miranda and Ariel, produce the most effects. The simulation here shows that, because of Miranda and Ariel, the rings are limited to a certain location. They cannot extend past 4.3 planetary radii because this region becomes extremely unstable and nothing can orbit there without being kicked out or falling into the planet with the calculations showing us how far a lot of the rings can extend around three of these gas giants. So Jupiter seems to have the biggest limitation, Uranus has the second biggest, and Saturn is able to form the largest rings, which is precisely what we observe in real life as well. This unfortunately does not cover Neptune, and so it'd be curious to find out where Neptune is as well. But I guess the biggest suggestion in the study is of course that these rings must have been much bigger, possibly even as big as Saturn's but only lasted for a few hundred thousand years, disappearing in the process. And we know that Saturn's rings are also disappearing, which you can learn more about in the video in the description. But intriguingly, something keeps replenishing some of the material in the rings, just like in the Saturnian system as well. And that something is most likely, once again, the moons. And so it's quite possible that either because of various impacts, or potentially cryovolcanism coming from the surface of these moons, a lot of the material gets replenished over time, and gets deposited back into the rings, basically suggesting that this is a kind of a renewable event, with the rings not really decreasing in size as quickly as they should be decreasing. And so it's quite likely that these are still relatively old rings, possibly hundreds of millions years old as well, because it looks like after about several million years, the overall loss here decreases quite dramatically, with the overall balance of mass remaining the same. Nevertheless, it is still quite surprising how much mass loss is produced by the interaction with the moons, and how these interactions with the moons make all of the gas giants have very different rings compared to one another. And then the last discovery was from Uranus itself, and specifically from its upper atmosphere. Here, for the first time ever, astronomers finally confirmed Uranus has infrared aurora, as we always thought it did. And so unlike ultraviolet aurora on Jupiter and Saturn, or of course optical aurora right here on planet Earth, Uranus, because of the mix of hydrogen and helium, predominantly emits aurora in infrared light. And though this was always predicted, it's now been officially confirmed and observed by using the infrared instrument on top of WMCAC Observatory in Hawaii, which also confirms that pretty much all planets in the solar system have aurora of some sorts. We've discussed quite a lot of them in some of the videos in the description, but they all seem to be kind of different, a lot of them seem to be produced for various reasons that are different from planet Earth, and in case of Uranus and Neptune and actually a lot of other gas giants, 
they do not seem to come from the Sun or from solar interaction. As a matter of fact, it's currently unknown how this is formed, but it seems to be a result of strange magnetic fields present inside the planet. As a matter of fact, Uranus has one of the strangest magnetic fields out there, mostly because of the way it spins, and so because of this misalignment, its aurora are also unique and very different from anything else. And more intriguingly, the observations of these aurora potentially explain the unusual heat spots visible in various regions in the atmosphere of Uranus. It wasn't actually clear where these hot spots came from, with many being hundreds of degrees warmer than the atmosphere, but now this seems to suggest it's most likely from aurora. With all of this heat being pushed toward the magnetic equator, circulating the atmospheric layers in a way that's very different from other planets. But the thing is, to learn more about all of this and to basically understand this in more detail, we have to have a mission to Uranus. And luckily, NASA is sort of planning one at some point. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but at the moment, maybe in the next 10 years, we might hear more about this because in the last survey of planetary science and astrobiology, scientists highlighted that the mission to Uranus is basically number one priority. Now NASA hasn't confirmed anything yet, but it might happen. Although if it does happen, it's most likely going to be mid-2030s. So I guess 10 years from now. Which means that you're going to be hearing more about this from a much more older Anton in the next 10 years. Subscribe for that video and also make sure to stay subscribed because there are going to be a lot more videos about other topics in the meanwhile. Anyway, on that note, well that's pretty much all I wanted to mention about Uranus and these are the main discoveries from the last few months. You can learn about previous discoveries from 2023 in one of the videos right there. But on that note, thank you for watching, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, come back in the next 10 years to learn more about this mission to Uranus, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.